Hello, everyone. I'm Srini Devadas. I'm going to be describing work done over a period of about 15 years on physical unclonable functions. Storing digital information in a device such that it is resistant to physical attack is difficult and expensive. The problem is that an adversary through a delayering process can physically extract keys from secure non-volatile memory such as E square prom while the processor is off. Perhaps a more pressing problem is that you need a trusted party to embed and test secret keys in a secure location for the billions of devices that need to have unique secrets stored inside of them. There is an alternative approach, which is to extract secret key information individual to each system by exploiting the complexities of the physical system. Not this particular physical system, but rather looking at integrated circuits through the lens of random process variations and realizing that no two integrated circuits, even with exactly the same mask layout, are identical because when they're fabricated on two different pieces of silicon, things come out a little bit different. So physical unclonable functions or puffs could be viewed as a silicon biometric. Observing obviously 3D structure variances is difficult, but the fact is that the differences in fabrication variation manifest themselves as differences in delays of wires um, as well as gates. And this brought about the notion of delay-based silicon physical unclonable functions. You have a combinational circuit. It's got certain inputs, but the timing of the signals as they propagate through the circuit is different for the same circuit fabricated across multiple different chips. Perhaps the simplest realization of a physical unclonable function is a pair of ring oscillators or an array of ring oscillators where adjacent pairs are compared to each other. You have the top two ring oscillators that are going to oscillate with slightly different frequencies, even on the same chip. And definitely you know, every ring oscillator in different chips will have its own unique frequency if it's measured to a fine enough precision. So let these ring oscillators run for a while and keep a count of how many times they oscillated and decide to generate a random bit, um, E1, for example, based on comparing the frequencies of the top two adjacent ring oscillators, generate a second bit based on comparing the third and fourth ring oscillators, et cetera. When you do this, um, you end up getting variation of two different kinds. And the first variation is the variation we want, which is, that these ring oscillators are going to oscillate with different frequencies and across different chips, if you fabricated an array of ring oscillators and compared pairs within each chip, you're going to get inter-chip variation in that a pair in chip A or puff A is going to be different, but you know, close to 50% probability to the same pair in exactly the same position in chip B or puff B. And the second variation is bad variation in that because you have an analog quantities getting turned into digital quantities, if in fact ring oscillators are really close in frequency, these frequencies change with temperature and voltage. And it's entirely possible that a pair produces a one from a given chip and produces a zero at a different time. Some preliminary experiments from years ago gave us this chart where we generated 128 bits from each chip or each puff and compared random 128 bit vectors produced from different chips and got this plot where the inter-chip variation is 
centered kind of close to 64, which is 128 divided by two, and is close to ideal. Unfortunately, there is significant variation in the individual chip response because of noise, as I said before. And this implies that you end up on the left part of the curve, essentially having 16 out of the 28, 128 bits, potentially um, having a, a differences or bit flips from one regeneration to another. So what we need to do is to produce stable keys from these puffs in order to use these outputs as cryptographic keys. The notion of fuzzy extractors allows us to do that from any biometric source. And in particular, we have the biometric source being an input to a generate function that is also going to um, encode a secret key, which is completely randomly selected, let's say from a hardware random number generator. And E and S through the generate algorithm are going to produce helper data B, which is going to be useful in the reproduce step or the rep step where when you regenerate from the biometric source, um, you rerun the ring oscillators again, you have some error rate associated with that. So you get E prime, which is not exactly equal to E, but using the helper data B, one can regenerate the exact bit exact secret S. So this um, fuzzy extractor notion was originally proposed in an information theoretic setting where you recognize that the pub public data B is going to leak information about E as well as S. And in the information theoretic sense, the number of remaining secret bits is going to be the number of bits in S minus the number of bits you expose in B. The basic problem with the fuzzy extractor approach in this information theoretic setting is that as the error rate goes up, the amount of helper data goes up and the number of secret bits that you have left goes down, which means that you have to use more E bits to encode these S bits. And um, that in turn increases the number of errors, if not the error rate, which increases the size of B, et cetera. So it's, it's quite a delicate process to choose the values of the numbers of E, S, and B in order to get an information theoretic security argument. Um, there's an alternative approach that's a computational fuzzy extractor that I'd like to describe, whose security is based on the hardness of learning parity with noise or the LPN problem. The classic LPN problem is shown here where there's a set of linear equations associated with BI equals AI times S plus EI. And there's uh, essentially M of these equations where S is the secret. It is an n-bit secret. Each of the AIs are n-bit vectors. So you can take the dot product and get a bit out of it. And um, each of the EIs and the BIs are single bits. And so the LPN problem simply says, it's hard to discover S given AI and BI. So you give away all of those for all M, assuming that there's a non-zero noise level associated with the EIs. So the EIs are essentially unpredictable. And this is true um, for any M greater than N, um, where you can generate a thousand equations. Um, and as long as each of the EIs are correspond to random noise of a thousand bits, then um, it doesn't matter that S only has, let's say, a hundred bits in it. LPN is still hard. This is going to be important, um, and so rem remember that. Um, and so let's look at the gen step with the view of looking at the learning parity with noise problem as a way of developing a computational fuzzy extractor. We're going to think of the puff as generating the noise associated with the EI values. S is randomly chosen and it's secret. The A's can be fabricated onto the chip across different chips, they can be the same. Um, obviously the S is different for the different chips as well as the E's. And so the B's are gonna be different as well. 
they're going to be chip specific and we're going to essentially generate the public data helper data associated with the bis or the capital b from the previous slide after choosing a secret by computing a1 s plus e1 a2 s plus e2 etc so that's a generate step pretty straightforward and now when we want to reproduce this well we know the bis we're going to store this publicly that's the helper data the a's are hard coded on the chip we obviously don't know s because uh, s was this ephemeral um, uh, secret that uh, disappeared after the gen we tried to encode it in the helper data and uh, we are also going to use the puff to get s back but what we have here is that when the puff regenerates as i told you we're not going to get exactly the eis back we're going to get e prime eyes back which are a little bit different from the eis so um what happens now is that we're in a situation where um your ei prime values are not the same as the ei values and so we can't really do this reproduce efficiently because we don't quite know how to solve the system of equations which is maybe an easy lpn problem but that's not a polynomial time solvable problem because we don't have the exact ei values if you go back to the ring oscillators we realize that we can look at this a little bit differently in the sense that we could imagine that we could compute not just the ei comparisons of the counter values but also have a hint as to which of these eis is stable by looking at the difference between the counter values and the idea is that if you have two ring oscillators that are very far apart in frequency the difference in the counter values is going to be large and it's very unlikely that even with dramatic environmental variation that a ring oscillator that's running at 1 gigahertz is going to get faster than a ring oscillator that was running at 2 gigahertz at a particular temperature uh, even though the temperature changes the first ring oscillator is going to be slower than the second uh, which means that our ei value is going to be stable and we can get a hint as to which of these ei values is stable by looking at the difference in the counter values we're not going to expose the ci or the ei values to the adversary i want to make that clear but what we can do is given that m is greater than n and we only need n out of these m ei prime values to be exactly correct and as long as we know what these are we have um essentially n equations uh, that we could use to solve for s and we're going to choose the appropriate n out of these m equations by simply looking for the most stable bits corresponding to the ci values that are the largest so just choose the ci values n of these that are the largest pick the equations perhaps there b1 b5 etc and bm minus 1 there's n of these equations we know the b's we know the a's we have great confidence that the e2 e5 em minus 1 values were exactly the same as when as what they were in the generate step and so now we have an error free system of linear equations that we can solve using gaussian elimination and the beauty of the scheme is that you can grow k where you can think of m as being k times n and depending on the error rate you can set your k value to be 3 or 4 um because um you're going to get a certain percentage of bits to be stable with high confidence if you set m to be very large if k is large and you can use that to um handle large error rates unlike in the information theoretic setting k does not affect security because as i said um regardless of m m can be larger than n but our lpn assumption essentially says that as long as each of the ei values is generated randomly uh, you're going to have a, uh, you're going to the adversary is going to have a difficult time solving lpn and the adversary does not know the eis or the ei primes or the cis 
And so um, this is um, actually works in practice. Um, it's been used um, a variety of different puffs, SRAM puffs in particular, ring oscillator puffs with a variety of error correction schemes are being used to generate secret keys in FPGAs and uh, crypto processor products. Thank you.